as Eppie said, I write a lot. So uh, I actually write every single day on a blog called thefinancer.com. And um, I've been doing that since um, 2009. So it's quite a long time. Um, what's the future? What's the future? Um, that's what we all want to know. That's what we don't know. What's the future? And um, I spend all my time thinking about the future of financial services. And being in crowdsourcing week is rather different because I'm guessing you're not, you're not bankers. Um, you kind of don't look like bankers anyway. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how financial services is changing because obviously crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer networks change the nature of how we exchange value, which is what the focus of my newest book is. Uh, I started writing about this sort of thing back in 2007. And uh, back then, I was talking about how we'd have video connectivity and services through the financial markets. We haven't got that yet in this country, but we do in some countries like Poland, where MBank provides all their customer service through uh, video channels um, on Skype. Um, I produced another book a couple of years ago called Digital Bank, which is all about how to launch or become a digital bank. And the problem with banks is that they are built on physical distribution of paper in a localized network focused upon buildings and humans. And what the banking system is trying to do now is to turn that on its head and say, what we have to do is look at digital distribution of data through the globalized network of the internet and then put buildings and humans on top of that network. And that's a huge ask for banks that have 200,000 employees and thousands of branches and global networks that are physical rather than digital. And then what's really happening now is a massive change thanks to the technologies of APIs, apps, artificial intelligence, uh, augmented services, data analytics, uh, mobile in particular as the front end access, the internet of things coming soon. And specifically for value exchange, uh, the blockchain technology, which I'll talk about a little bit um, because it's becoming something that's quite annoying if I'm honest. It uh, goes with big data and cloud. It's like this thing that everyone talks about and no one knows what it is until you look under the hood and not enough people look under the hood. So we're going to have a little look under the hood of the Internet of Value and uh, how these technologies are changing everything and in particular how that relates to crowdsourcing, crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer connectivity and networking. Because we're fundamentally going through a revolution of how we connect in that in previous revolutions like the Industrial Revolution, we started to produce things and move things more rapidly. Um, but we didn't connect everyone. You know, at the moment, there's only 2 billion people who have bank accounts, and there's 7 billion people on the planet. And what's actually happening now is that through the global networking of mobile and internet, everybody is getting on the network. Every single human is on the network. And Epi just referenced Bill Gates's vision of no more poor countries by 2035. And the whole reason why he believes that is that mo mobile provides financial inclusion for everybody on the planet, because everybody on the planet can access the network and exchange value peer-to-peer, -peer, direct. But this is something, ah. <laughs> it's a very young revolution. <laughs> I always like to do that, because it puts the um, willies up the organizers of the conference. Um, it's a very young revolution. We still have a lot of problems with this revolution. It's only 70 years old in that uh, the first general purpose computer came out in 1946 called ENIAC. And um, since then, obviously, things have got faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper under Moore's law, but there's still a long way to go. If you look at the last revolution, the Industrial Revolution, it actually started in 1606. And that's when the first patent was made for a steam-powered something, in this case, a steam pump for use in mines. And steam was really the power force that was behind the Industrial Revolution, and that the steam train, uh, steam engines, allowed us to go across continents. And the last patent was in 1933 for a steam-powered aeroplane, which is not recommended. Um, but as you can see, you know, three centuries, over three centuries of turbocharged change, as particularly seen in the Victorian era. And yet now we're saying we've got 20,000 years of change in this century from Ray Kurzweil. And that's because we're going through another massive change in connectivity, in inclusion, in communication, in relationships, in value exchange. 
Now, when you look at the last revolution, people thought about faster horses because they had no idea about the car engine of Henry Ford that came after this. So it was really based around steam trains moving us across continents and faster horses. If you don't believe that they really did think about faster horses, this is a vision of what, what was going on at the time. I mean, we all think about the Victorian era as nice ladies in bonnets being greeted by gentlemen in top hats and horses and carriages looking lovely. But the reality was that it was full of shit. <laughs> This is London in the 1800s, and manure everywhere. You know, they had thousands of people employed to clean up the streets and get rid of this horse manure. And the more people traveled around London in horse and carriage, the more you had crap on the streets. And their solution for the crap on the streets was steam-powered horses, because this is a vision of 1825 around the future. And in particular here, to get rid of the slop on the streets, a steam-powered horse. So it really was faster horses based on this view of the time that steam was the focus. And we are constrained by what we think right now. I mean, none of us probably thought a decade ago that we'd be all connecting via our mobile devices through lots of apps to everybody on the planet. It wasn't, the iPhone wasn't here. You know, we didn't think that way. And yet now it's totally natural to believe that's just the way we live. You know, we wouldn't live without our phones and our communications. What's interesting is every time there's a revolution in trade and a revolution in commerce, there's a revolution in the financial system. And so 5,000 years ago, we invented money because of the agricultural changes that were going on with farming. 300 years ago, we invented banks. You know, banks were invented specifically to issue paper as a value exchange mechanism. And that's the reason why banks are licensed by governments, because governments allow banks on their behalf to issue paper that can be trusted as a value store. And some of us still use checks. The other great invention of the Industrial Revolution was the postage stamp, so we could put a check in the post. Fantastic innovation, but it's slow and expensive. You know, I got a check from an American client in October last year, and I banked it, and because it was over 10,000 pounds in value, it took 28 days to clear into my account, and it cost me about $200 to process. And it took seven days to arrive because it was posted to me. So 35 days in total as a cycle. That's ridiculous in the internet age. It's stupid. And what we really want is something that's fast, and we want something that's cheap. And that's what's coming. That's what the internet of value is. That's what you guys deal with in terms of connectivity. And the chip at the moment we think of as being in mobile devices and tablets, but it's actually in everything soon as we get into the Internet of Things, you know, chips inside televisions, inside cars, inside shoes and handbags. You know, everything gets intelligence in a real-time transactional capability. And in a real-time transaction capability, exchanging value has to be cheap, which is why the shared ledger structures coming out of blockchain get very interesting, because that's something that will enable this Internet of Value. So looking at the two technologies, uh, just to illustrate how quickly it changes things, Let's start with maybe looking at um, real-time connectivity based upon chips and devices. And right now, we think of the chips and devices as being mobile. Uh, as I say, soon as the Internet of Things. But when we look at mobile, I think really illustrating how it dynamically changed value exchange and financial structures is illustrated really well by these two guys, Ikram and Andy, who you may not know, but they're two millennials who are you know, really into developing things, and in this case, apps. And during a weekend in 2011, Ikram visited Andy for a, a fun weekend out and forgot his wallet. So Andy had to sub him for the whole weekend. And they wrote down all the things that were being bought during the weekend, paninis, cappuccinos, martinis, whatever. And at the end of the weekend, like friends do, uh, Ikram went home and was going to put a check in the post to Andy and thought, what am I doing? You know, we develop stuff. We both use PayPal. Why am I putting a check in the post? This is not the way we should do things. And so they got together and thought about the problem and realized the problem with PayPal is that PayPal is really for big ticket items. And they wanted small ticket exchange for paninis and martinis. So they developed an app called Venmo. And Venmo is a social payments app which allows you to transact over PayPal very small numbers, you know, small items. You could just buy a magazine and pay for it by Venmo. And Venmo got bought by Braintree in 2012 for $26 million. And Braintree got bought by PayPal for $800 million in 2013. And PayPal thought Venmo was cool because they found it sitting in Braintree. 
And now it's become the standard way for friends to exchange value, to exchange money in America. Two and a half billion dollars in just Q4 2015 alone transacted through a social app created over a drunken weekend by two guys in their 20s. And that's how smartphones change things really quickly because it's viral. Everything goes immediately in real time globally if you wanted to. PayPal has been buying some other guys, so they brought Modest, which is a contextual social media exchange system for knowing where people are, what they're doing, and getting more leverage around what they're trying to achieve with their lives. And the two guys who created Modest are Harper Reed and Dylan Richards. And you can tell by the way I dress, I have taken my tie off today so I'm being cool, that I'm in banking. And the problem that banks have is they can't really work very well with these guys because they're trying to mix the regulations and the constraints of minimizing risk and doing things in a very regulated structure under government license with this innovation that's coming from technology, this dramatic change from fintech that's changing our world. And when I talked about Venmo and talked about Modest, I mean, we're really talking about developed markets. And yet, more exciting is this idea of the other five billion people who've been underserved by the financial institutions because they're ignored being able to come into the network. In Africa in particular, the network is getting very interesting around mobile connectivity because immediately Africans are saying, we can do value exchange through airtime, through minutes on the network. That, you know, that's a form of value. You go to Zimbabwe, after their currency imploded, you can get your change as minutes on the mobile network when you spend and pay for things with real money. That's a form of value exchange. So we think of value exchange very differently. You know, value exchange is based around ideas. You know, PewDiePie makes $7 million a year from YouTube just out of showing people how to play games. You know, anything can be monetized and form a value exchange mechanism in this new network. And the fantastic thing about inclusion of people in Africa is that they're now able to become merchants and actually therefore raise themselves out of poverty, ensure themselves against famine which they couldn't do before, which is why Bill Gates is so excited about mobile financial services. You know, this guy is from the M-Pesa website, and he's a farmer in the plains of Kenya with milk, meat, and leather to sell. And before, he could only sell milk, milk meat, and leather to villages that were near him. Now he's got a mobile phone. He can sell milk, meat, and leather to anybody in Kenya or anybody in Africa or anybody in the world because he's got a Facebook page. He's got an Instagram account. He's got M-Pesa, so he can take money and airtime minutes as forms of value exchange in return for giving you milk, meat, and leather. So everybody now is a merchant, and they have a point of sale in their hand to make and take a payment. Peer-to-peer -peer connectivity of 7 billion people who can all exchange money in real time immediately. But the problem is it's not free. It's actually quite expensive. You know, if you look at um, what I said about banking, 35 days, $200, that's not good. If you do small transactions, it's still expensive and still get charges. And Africans are saying, we need to use something else to exchange money on a mobile network for near free. And they are developing blockchain-based services. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are creating a spin-off that came out of Bitcoin based around shared ledgers to enable Africans to exchange money for nothing for free. And that's what's actually really exciting. But the problem with blockchain is everybody keeps talking about it, but they don't know what it is. And you may know what it is, but just in case you don't, it's just really a form of proving that something happened with a date and timestamp on the internet through a shared database, a shared ledger. You know, cloud, to me, is just a shared computer on the internet or shared software service on the internet. This is just a shared database on the internet. But the good thing about the shared database is that once you record something on a blockchain shared ledger structure, then it's notarized for all time and irrevocable because you can prove it happened. It's date and time stamped by a consensus of computers on the internet to say that happened on that date at that time, and this is the transaction. So you can prove anything. And originally it was for Bitcoin exchange out of Satoshi Nakamoto's paper in 2009. But now what's interesting is the banks, the governments, um, corporations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are all saying we can actually notarize anything happening between people anywhere, such as the sale of a house, a marriage contract, um, an exchange of funds, a clearing and settlement service. You know, this is just the small world of financial services exchange. Uh, in terms of what people are doing on blockchains, public and private blockchains. 
It's a really complicated, complicated, I've only got a few minutes, so I'm not going to explain all of it, except to say that just in one area, like clearing and settlement, there are companies, many companies, forming to look at how to clear and settle equities and security settlements on the internet for almost free. And Santander say that if we get that structure in place, it'll save the financial system $20 billion a year in processing. So it's an important development te of technology. It's why fintech is so hot. If we look at fintech, billions of dollars going into fintech companies. According to Ernst & Young, $19 billion in 2015, 12 billion in 2014. And this is where you guys really show that you can change the game, because you can change the business models of financial institutions by saying, if you do it through buildings and humans, you've got to have a large basis differential of percentage points between having money coming in and giving money out. If you don't want software and servers, you can collapse the margins. You can destroy the financial system, because literally, there is no margin on software and servers except for the small points you put in the algorithms. You, there's no buildings and humans involved. You've just changed the game. It's the reason why all the bank systems are being unbundled by fintech, because you can take anything and literally change it into a software server algorithmic-based exchange of value or exchange of value store or anything that's financial. And what's interesting is this is a survey of bank C-suite executives. And when asked, do you know what these companies do, none of them did, except for PayPal. They all had heard of PayPal, but 8% of bank CXOs don't know what PayPal does. It's quite amazing. And they probably don't know anything about the firms that are listed on that horse over there, or maybe it should be a unicorn. <laughs> so the impact upon banks is actually interesting, but it's actually not going to be a massive impact. You would want it to be bigger. You know, right now, they're saying 20% of banks' profits from credit markets will go into crowdfunding. That's according to Goldman Sachs. 20% of their profits will disappear in the next five years to alternative financial services. But banks have this advantage because they're licensed by governments that they can move in their own time because banks are looking after money and we want our money to be safer than our selfies. You, know, you lose a selfie on Facebook, it's not a big deal. Lose 10,000 pounds, you don't like it very much. So banks are actually restructuring their models, and they have to, because the business model changes thanks to what you and others are doing. I'm not really going to spend time on this, so I'm just going to literally go over this section. It's all about what banks have to do, and I'm aware that I'm on to finish, because I'm running out of time. So if you want to know what banks have to do, I can tell you over coffee. I just wanted to finish with going back to this revolution that we're going through and saying, once again, you have to remember that it's very young. It's got a long way to go, only 70 years maybe three centuries of dynamic change through networking together, thinking about the fact that you know, just bringing in five billion people, the whole planet, into peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, that changes the planet. But when we look at the future, you know, we have things going on that are quite incredible. I mean, this is a high-definition camera that doctors can put inside you to see inside your gut before they operate on you, or whilst they're operating on you. They can look inside your heart or your kidneys and actually see what's going on in your body in real time. <laughs> in high definition through his tiny camera. Equally, they can print pieces of your body to replace body parts that are worn out. That gets interesting. You, know, you can print almost anything. There's recently a baby that had a replacement of esophagus that was 3D printed. Um, you can print bladders. You, and if you get body parts that need replacing that are too big to print or too complicated, like an arm, you can just put a robotic arm on a human you know, the Barnet woman is here. It does exist. We have the technology to rebuild people. And equally, robotics are getting interesting in that we're seeing robotics appearing more and more in reality. You know, banks in Japan now have robot servers in their branches. I thought the same was true in Britain, but I realized they were humans. They kind of look, they act the same way. And for that reason, we're going to see people living to about 150 years old. You know, scientists already say that people will live to 150 and the average human will live to 100. You know, what does that do to pensions, to home ownership, to work? And when we look out even further, you know, smart homes, all the homes connected, being able to do peer-to-peer -peer connectivity in real time from your TVs and your cars. When your cars drive themselves, what does that, that, that do for car insurance? You know, there's never any accidents. Who needs car insurance? And when Elon Musk came up with the idea of the loop, which is an 800-mile-an-hour connection between San Francisco and Los Angeles, people thought he was nuts. 
but now people are working on it to make it a reality. An 800 mile per hour train, so to speak, connecting people between cities. You know, the Elon Musk, a hero of many, sends stuff into space. He's now saying we'll, we'll colonize Mars by 2025. It sounds nuts, but then a lot of science fiction does, and then it becomes reality. And the reality is that you never saw anyone on Star Trek get their wallet out and pay for anything. So that's why the future is so exciting for me, because we're changing the system. Thank you.